Austin, watching and listening to Words on Film on Somerville Community Access TV or some community TV station that kind of pick up this broadcast, and then I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So I have five new movies to review for you for this show. First, though, I'm going to start off with my normal topic, which is what's topping the box office, the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. And there are actually kind of a few surprises here. Uh, particularly, there, uh, the number one movie is probably no surprise, the least surprising of them all. Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald, which is, of course, a prequel to the Harry Potter book series and also a sequel to Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, which came out, I believe, in 2015, 2016. I don't know the exact year, but I'll figure that out when I get to the review. But anyway, it had a very good weekend. It grossed $62.2 million here at home. Around the world, it grossed a staggering $253.7 million, and that is against a projected budget of $200 million. So while it's not a hit yet here at home, it still has a ways to go and certainly plenty of time to reach there. Plus, I'm guessing that Thanksgiving weekend, this movie's going to make probably as much money, if not more, than what it's making right now or what it's made last weekend. The Grinch was number one at the box office last week. It's probably not going to go anywhere. It it slid slightly to number two this past weekend, having grossed $38.6 million at the U.S. box office, U.S. and Canadian box office. Against a budget of roughly $75 million, The Grinch has so far grossed $127 million here in the States and Canada, and $152.2 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States already, which is really good after two weeks, and a certified hit all around the world. So we're not going to see The Grinch going anywhere, at least anytime soon. And that can't be said for every holiday-themed movie in the top ten. But more on that later. Bohemian Rhapsody was number two at the box office last week. This week it slid to number three, having grossed $16 million, which doesn't sound like a lot, but against a budget of 50 to $55 million, Bohemian Rhapsody has so far grossed $128.2 million here at home and a staggering $386 million worldwide, making it already a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Instant Family is the number two highest grossing debut movie of the week, but this weekend it is number four at the box office, having grossed $14.5 million here at home against a budget of $48 million. Now, while it has a relatively modest budget, it still has a ways to go to recoup its budget, and it is unlikely to do that next week, but it could do that in two weeks. Of course, we'll have to see. As for international numbers, I don't have those for you for this movie. Widows is number five at the box office and the third highest grossing debut debut movie of the week. I knew I'd screw that up somehow. Having grossed $12.4 million here at home and $19.6 million around the world, and that's against a budget of $42 million. So Widows is a is a movie that probably has even longer to go to recoup its budget than it does than Instant Family does. But then again, I don't know how much Instant Family made all around the world. I probably should know by next week. The Nutcracker in the Four Realms is the movie I was specifically talking about when I said that not every holiday movie is doing really well. As a matter of fact, I would be surprised if I saw The Nutcracker in the Four Realms in the top ten next week. But it's number six of the box office this weekend, falling from number four last week. And against a budget of 120 to $133 million, The Nutcracker in the Four Realms has so far grossed just $44 million here at home and $116.9 million worldwide. So it's doing pretty decently around the world, but here at home, it looks like it's going to be a flop. Although on the bright side, Disney has had a lot of hits to compensate for The Nutcracker and the Four Realms, especially when it comes to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. A Star is Born was number five at the box office last week. This week is number seven, having grossed $4.3 million here at home last or this past weekend. Against a budget of... $13.5 
36 to $40 million, somewhere in that range. A Star is Born has so far grossed $185.8 million here at home so far. And around the world, it has grossed $341.5 million, making it a certified hit right here and also a certified hit around the world. So very good for A Star is Born. And you'll probably be hearing a lot more about A Star is Born, even if it makes its way out of the top 10, come Oscar season, which is coming up very soon. Overlord is a movie that took a big drop, surprisingly. I thought that word of mouth would elevate this film. Last week, it debuted at number three at the box office. This weekend, it's number eight, having grossed just $3.8 million. So I guess the word of mouth wasn't strong enough. But against a budget of $38 million, Overlord has so far grossed $17.7 million here at home and $32.7 million worldwide, which means that it's neither a hit here in the States or around the world. And it's very close to being a tentative hit around the world, and it might be by next week. But then again, we might not see it in the top 10 next week. Another movie that's struggling even more than Overlord is The Girl and the Spider's Web, which debuted last week at number six, and this week it is number nine at the box office, having grossed $2.5 million here at home just this past weekend. Against a budget of $43 million, though, The Girl in the Spider's Web has so far grossed $13.3 million here at home and $26.6 million worldwide, which means that it's not a hit here in the States or around the world and is unlikely to be successful even during the Thanksgiving week. But then again, I could be wrong. But going from number six to number nine, that doesn't bode well for The Girl in the Spider's Web. That is for sure. And at number 10 is a movie that I have never heard of, let alone seen. It's a movie called Burn the Stage, the Movie, and it's about some K-pop group. Uh, by K-pop, I mean Korean pop group. It made $2.4 million at the US, U.S. and Canadian box office this past weekend, and $14 million around the world against a budget of what? I don't know, but it's one of those films that had a very temporary release. Apparently. The possibility of lung cancer can be pretty scary, especially if you're one of approximately 8 million current or former smokers at high risk. That's why SaveByTheScan.org wants you to know that now there's a breakthrough low-dose CT scan that can detect lung cancer early, and it only takes 60 seconds. You stop smoking. Now start screening. For an easy quiz to see if you're eligible, visit SaveByTheScan.org. It could save your life. SaveByTheScan.org is brought to you by the American Lung Association's Lung Force Initiative and the Ad Council. Never Stop the Madness, Tuesdays at 9 p.m., bostonfreeradio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald, which I mentioned in the previous segment is a prequel to the Harry Potter series, but also a sequel to Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, which was actually made two years ago back in 2016. And that was a film I enjoyed immensely. I'm a big Harry Potter fan. I've read all seven books. And if the Fantastic Beasts movies had first been made into books, rest assured I would have read those as well. But interestingly enough, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them was the very first book that was not only a spinoff of the Harry Potter series, but it's also the first movie that J.K. Rowling wrote the screenplay to without actually writing the book first, which is kind of fascinating. And as it turns out, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is actually my favorite Harry Potter movie. A lot of people have an affinity for the previous Harry Potter films, but as for me, since I read the books first, the movies hadn't quite grown on me, but... The original Fantastic Beast movie, I loved it. I mean, I, I liked just about everyone who acted in the movie. Eddie Redmayne, Catherine Waterston, Dan Fogler, Alison Sudol, they were all great. So I had high anticipation for Fantastic Beast, The Crimes of Grindelwald, particularly because it, 
Well, the, the first one was so good, and just about everyone was returning for, or at least the actors were returning for this movie. And plus you had a number of other high-profile actors who were in this film who were not in the previous film. You had Johnny Depp as Gellert Grindelwald, who is a dark wizard who's being held by the Magical Congress of the United States of America, um, Mac Macusa, <laughs> which is a great acronym, by the way. And when he was departing New York City for transfer back to London by the prisoners at Macusa, he is actually freed and makes an escape and, of course, wreaks ha ha havoc on the Wizarding World. And in addition to Johnny Depp, Jude Law actually appears in this movie as a young Albus Dumbledore, who not only teaches at Hogwarts, but also works for the British Ministry of Magic and appoints Newt Scamander, who is the zoologist, the magical zoologist, played by Eddie Redmayne, reprising his role, to track down Grindelwald and also track down an accomplice of Grindelwald, who is a young apprentice who has a lot of magical power, but under the wrong guidance, that magical power could be lethal. So you might be thinking that this young apprentice is Tom Riddle, who eventually grows up to be Voldemort, and unfortunately you'd be wrong. Instead, it's a young guy by the name of Credence. And other than... It would have been more interesting if... Credence was Tom Riddle, because then there would be a better connection, I think, to the, the Harry Potter series. But then again, I, I think when they inevitably make a sequel to this movie, uh, the, the third Fantastic Beast movie, they will, if, uh, Tom Riddle will eventually make an appearance, and who knows, maybe even Harry Potter's parents might make an appearance as well. There, there's certainly a lot to be set up here, and not only are the special effects in this movie amazing, both when they use the dark arts magic and also the good kind of magic that Newt Scamander uses as a magical zoologist, but the acting by just about everyone involved is also really good. Of course, Eddie Redmayne, uh, Catherine Waterston, Dan Fogler, and Alison Sudol certainly make the most out of their reprising their roles from the previous movie. All of them are good. And Johnny Depp is also effectively scary as Gellert Grindelwald, probably even scarier than Voldemort. But then again, I told you my feelings about the Harry Potter movies in juxtaposition to the book. So... Of course, I'm biased in that regard. So this is a, a really great film to look at, but unfortunately, it gets muddled up in so many subplots where it, it could have been an easy film to keep track of. And I think that one of the main reasons that this movie did not live up to its predecessor is because it seemed to have such a simple plot. You had Gellert Grindelwald, Johnny Depp's character, escaping from a magical Congress prison, and you would think that the only people who would stop him would be Newt Scamander and his team of wizards. But the, the plot, unfortunately, gets really complicated, beginning with the introduction of the character of Credence. And I think, as I was watching this, I was thinking, well, okay... Credence certainly has a power of which he's unaware, and it could be used for evil. But if it's not connected to Voldemort, why should I care? I'd never, as I said, I've read all seven of the previous Harry Potter movies, or rather, Harry Potter books, which later became movies, and I don't believe that Credence was ever mentioned in any of them. Then again, neither was Grindelwald, but at the same time, there's... There's a good introduction to Grindelwald here, but it doesn't connect to future characters we should care about later on in the series, especially Voldemort. And there's no indication that either Grindelwald or Credence, at least according to this movie, is going to be connected to Voldemort. Because if there's no connection to villains later on in the Harry Potter series, 
what's the point of introducing them here? So I might change my mind about Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald later. After all, when I first saw The Empire Strikes Back, the, the second Star Wars movie, which is the fifth chapter in the series, I didn't warm up to it especially, and I was kind of jarred by the fact that it ended on a negative note. But at the same time, I later revisited it and it eventually became my favorite Star Wars movie of all, bar none. So maybe I'll change my mind about The Crimes of Grindelwald, but right now it just seemed like it could have been a simpler plot. Instead, it got confused and muddled, and it gets my rating of a checkout. The saving grace of this movie is the acting by just about everyone involved, and the special effects are wondrous, as they probably should be. Imagine being fired because of who you love. Imagine being denied medical treatment because of who you marry. Imagine being evicted because of who you are. Millions of Americans don't have to imagine this. They have to live it. Because in 31 states, it's legal to discriminate against LGBT people. Get the facts at beyondido.org. Brought to you by the Gill Foundation and the Ad Council. Listen to She Likes It Heavy on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern on bostonfreeradio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Instant Family. And this is the latest starring Mark Wahlberg and Rose Byrne and is directed by Sean Anders, who directed Horrible Bosses 2 and both Daddy's Home movies, which also happened to co-star Mark Wahlberg. And it is a movie about a married couple, um... Somewhat young, I, I guess, comparatively. Uh, they're, 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 they're young enough to have, <laughs> well, let me put it to you this way. They're in their late 30s or early 40s, so they're young enough to have a vibrant social life, but they might be a little old to start family. But they find themselves in over their heads when they adopt three children or when they actually become foster parents for three children, all of all of whom are actually related to one another. And there is a difference between a foster family and an adopted family. A foster family is probably best described as temporary to permanent placement. In other words, there's no guarantee that an orphan that is selected to be with a foster family is going to stay with that foster family. As a matter of fact, there are very sad stories about there, uh, out there about foster kids who are bouncing around from family to family and really have no place to go until they're 18. And the kids in this movie are certainly no exception, but more on that later. But adoption is is when they finally say, okay, you're not bouncing around from family to family, you're staying right here. So the question that's on the mind of just about everyone who watches Instant Family is, will these two p- potential parents finalize this adoption and make the the family complete. I'm not going to give away whether or not that happens, but there are some surprises that are thrown in there. Now, the movie is written by Sean Anders and John Morris. Sean Anders directed this movie, and I had, interestingly enough, a few doubts about how good this movie would be based on the fact that Sean Anders has previously directed That's My Boy. He didn't write it, thankfully. That was David Casp. But unfortunately, he directed that movie, which I consider to be the worst film of 2012. But... Instant Family is fortunately a much, much better movie. And to Sean Anders' credit, he's directed better movies after That's My Boy. He directed the sequel to Horrible Bosses, and as I said, he directed both Daddy's Home movies, which were decent. They they weren't great, but Instant Family is certainly an improvement amongst all those. And it could be classified as not just a comedy, but a comedy drama, because this film, for one that looks as sleek as it does, 
actually addresses a lot of the uncomfortable truths about adults who adopt children, or rather serve as foster parents for these children. It doesn't shy away from some of the maladjustments that the kids have, as well as temper tantrums and <laughs> other things that could potentially go wrong with with being in a foster family. In other words, the, the period of adjustment. And as I was watching this film, I, of course, have no experience raising children, let alone uh, foster kids. But I'm one of those people who, if I am in the store and I see some parents struggling with their kid, I don't judge the parent. As a matter of fact, a lot of people have told me that parenting is hard, including my own parents. And guess what? I believe them. Some people are so audacious as to not believe them and, th and just come to the conclusion that their kids are going to be much better behaved, but I know better. <laughs> and I don't know if I'm going to have kids in the future. I'm 36 years old, but it might happen, but I am probably going to brace myself for the worst. And certainly the, the couple in this movie, Pete and Ellie, who are played by Mark Wahlberg and Rose Byrne respectively, certainly kind of know there are going to be difficulties, but they don't exactly know what kind. And I also liked how the movie took a realistic and serious approach, not too serious, though, to the foster parent process. In other words, you can't just go into a foster agency and expect to get a kid instantly. As a matter of fact, the standout performances in this movie, besides Mark Wahlberg and Rose Byrne, both of whom do well in this movie, are the people who run the foster care agency who are named Karen and Sharon. I don't know if it was a coincidence that their names rhymed, but they're played by Academy Award winner Octavia Spencer and stand-up comic Tig Notaro, respectively. And I thought they actually had some good poignant moments. And just about anything or any misconception you might have about this film is, I think, addressed well in this movie without being contrived. For instance, the, the couple, both of whom are white, end up adopting three Latino kids. Um, there's 15-year-old Lizzie, who's played by Isabella Monaire. There is 8-year-old Juan, who's played by Gustavo Quiroz. And there's also 5-year-old Lita, who's played by Juliana Gamis. And these three kids all have the same parents, but because their mother is in rehab and has had trouble with the law they are in the foster care system. So eventually Octavia Spencer and Tig Notaro's characters convince Mark Wahlberg and Rose Byrne's characters that it's best to adopt or rather take in all three of these kids so the period of just adjustment will at least be a little easier. And this movie certainly had its, its share of laughs, but it also had moments that actually made me tear up when I watched it. And I'm not going to tell you exactly how it ends. There are certainly a lot of uncomfortable moments, but i got to give credit to Sean Anders, who directed probably the worst film of 2012, but still bounced back with this film. That's My Boy could have ended his career. Why it didn't end Adam Sandler's career, I don't know, but... I got to give kudos to Sean Anders for bouncing back with this film. I absolutely loved it, and it gets my rating of a knockout. I liked Rose Byrne and Mark Wahlberg in it a lot. Uh, I also really loved Isabella Monaire, who's an actress I've been watching for a really long time in other films. And, yeah, th this movie is not comfortable to watch at, at times, but I think people will leave ultimately loving the film. I'm a 40-year-old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma. It was very hard for me, but Miss Araceli, she gave me direction. At age 47, Marco finished his high school diploma. 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. 
We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Come Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, hey. social events, what? And the black experience. Okay. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Widows, which is the latest from director Steve McQueen, who has directed 12 Years a Slave, and he also directed another film before 12 Years a Slave that I haven't seen. It it starred Michael Fassbender, where Michael Fassbender plays a sex addict. Um, I'd be interested to see that movie, but I just haven't had time. But Widows is the first film that Steve McQueen has directed that takes place in modern day America, specifically in temporary, Chica- excuse me, contemporary Chicago, amid a time of turmoil where four women with nothing in common except a debt left behind by their dead husband's criminal activities, take fate into their own hands and conspire to forge a future on their own terms. So the movie follows particularly three out of four women whose husbands all happen to be involved in the same robbery that led to their deaths. Um, There's Veronica, who's played by Viola Davis, whose husband is Harry Rawlings, who's played by Liam Neeson. And... Viola Davis's character is actually the head of a teacher's union, but despite that, she is unaware that her husband is involved in dangerous criminal activities until after he apparently perishes in a robbery gone wrong. But he's not the only one. There's also another man named Florek, who's played by John Bernthal, who only appears in the movie for less than a minute. There's also Carlos, played by Manuel Garcia Rolfo, and there's also a guy named Jimmy Nunn, who's played by Coburn Goss. Now, Liam Neeson being the bigger star amongst the three probably gets more screen time than the rest of them, but that doesn't make the film any less compelling, and it also doesn't make you feel any worse, or rather any mm, less for the other widows in this movie who find themselves stuck between a rock and a hard place, including Linda, who's played by Michelle Rodriguez. There's also Alice, who's played by Elizabeth DeBecky. And there is one other widow who is actually not brought into the conspiracy of of robbery that uh, Viola Davis's character finds herself trapped in. But there is one other woman who is actually a moonlighting babysitter for Michelle Rodriguez's character. And she's played by Cynthia Arrivo, who I noticed most from a movie that came out earlier this year that is probably going to be underrated for a while, maybe at least until its DVD or streaming release. And that is Bad Times at the El Royale. I loved Cynthia Arrivo in that movie. And I like her in this one too. Although interestingly enough, she has shorter hair in this movie than she did in Bad Times at the El Royale. And she, I did not actually recognize her. If anything, I was thinking, I, I thought it was, um, Isa Ray, who is, um, the woman who plays, awkward black girl in the YouTube series, which eventually became a Showtime series. But sure enough, it was uh, Cynthia Arrivo who was playing that role. And it is really exciting alone to see these four women just get together and try to pull off this robbery. (laughs) That's an ambulance, (laughs) which I'm cutting out of the podcast. (laughs) But in any event... And also, there are various subplots that weave in well here. For instance, there's a special election going on for a councilman of Chicago, particularly where there's a young man by the name of Jack Mulligan, or Young Enough Man, played by Colin Farrell, who is the son of a previous bigwig Chicago politician by the name of Tom Mulligan, who's played by Robert Duvall. And Jack Mulligan is actually in a in an election, a special election, with a candidate by the name of Jamal Manning, who's played in this movie in a really good breakthrough role by Brian Tyree Henry. And Jamal has a brother 
who is played by Daniel Kaluuya from the movie Get Out. And unlike the movie Get Out, Daniel Kaluuya's character, whose name is Jatem Manning, is very dangerous and is trying to keep his brother's name clean for the election while also engaging in shady underground activity. Well, as it turns out, Liam Neeson and his cronies in this film actually robbed $2 million from Jamal Manning, and Jamal Manning is giving a stern warning to Viola Davis's character that he wants that money back. So this is a film that makes politics, in addition to crime, look equally as dirty. But it it's pretty fascinating. I think all the characters in this the, this movie are incredibly strong, and especially when you focus on the the primary women in this movie, it, it's certainly a, a compelling film. I was especially taken back by the character Alice, played by Elizabeth Debicki. Excuse me, Debicki, <coughs> because she is a woman who is actually forced to be a call girl because of her husband's death and the fact that she can't make ends meet on her own. And it's actually her mother who's played in this movie by an Academy Award nominee. I'm going to have to look that look up who it is because the name is actually not coming to me. But this actress was in Silver Linings Playbook. She was in The Polka King. Her name is, if you'll excuse me, Jackie Weaver. That's it. <laughs> That's live radio for you. Yeah, she actually persuades her to get into the, the call girl business, but it's this robbery that Alice is planning with Veronica, who is Viola Davis's character, that can hopefully get all of them out of their rut. In addition to paying the $2 million they owe, they owe Jamal Manning, they can also split the other couple million amongst the three of them and live relatively comfortable lives, provided they don't get caught. So Widows is one of those films that's kind of like Heat in the sense that there are a lot of characters here, but they all intersect in the movie incredibly well. Plus, it tells a very compelling crime story about a conspiracy that could eventually go wrong, very much like the first part of this movie does. I loved Widows. It's a great follow-up to 12 Years a Slave by Steve McQueen. It gets my rating of a knockout. Of course, you can't compare Widows to 12 Years a Slave, but it shows Steve McQueen's versatility as a director. In 50 feet, turn left. Why are you driving so slowly? After a few drinks, I'm taking it slow. Well, you're not fooling the cop behind you. What? Get ready to pay in point one miles. Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving, because buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Welcome to where all the good tunes are. This is Boston Free Radio. I love those real six sons. Intensify and groove me. All this and more on Unpopular Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Border, which is a movie that comes out of Finland and is directed by Ali Abbasi, who directed the film Let the Right Ones In, which is a movie about vampires. And it they, they did actually make a remake of that film starring Chloe Grace Moretz a couple of years ago. And the backlash against the American remake of that movie was so, um, so apparent that Let Me In actually bombed at the box office, as opposed to Let the Right Ones In, which was a movie that didn't make a huge splash when it hit theaters in America. It was a big hit in its native Finland, but here in America, it didn't 
gain a cult following until its DVD release um, way back in the early aughts. But Border is Ali Abbasi's arguable follow-up to Let the Right Ones In, although there he could have directed other films after that. I'm sure he did. But I don't have time to look up them up right now. But Border is about a customs officer who has an unusually shaped face. Some would probably say it looks more like a Cro-Magnon caveman, or at least what archaeologists think they look like. But either way, it's it's... It's not exactly deformed, but it does look unusual. But this customs officer in Finland can literally smell fear, which is what makes her good at her um, her airline security job. But she eventually it develops an unusual attraction to a strange traveler who has her same kind of facial features while aiding a police investigation, which will call into question her entire existence. And... What's interesting is the the woman, the customs officer in this film, is played by Eva Melander. And, of course, a lot of American audiences, a lot of English-speaking audiences, probably aren't familiar with that actress. But if you actually go on IMDb and look at a picture of Eva Melander and compare that to how she looks in this movie, it is staggering how good the makeup is in this film for both her and also the character who plays her love interest who's the character's name is Vor and he's and he's played by an actor named Eero Mil- Milanoff M I L O N O F F Milanoff Milanoff one of those names but in any event and Border is one of those films that might look like a werewolf film at first, or it might seem like Beauty and the Beast, but eventually, fortunately, it's not that predictable, which I really liked about it, and it also kind of has enough originality in its storytelling to develop a story all its own. And some American audiences might w- crave that kind of predictability and might not see this movie for what it is, but I really hope they look beyond its its lack of familiarity and actually see a movie that's beautiful as well as gripping and doesn't quite lead in the direction you might want it to lead. I, I actually found that lack of predictability a bit jarring, as I usually do, but that's not to say that I don't appreciate... Uh, that I don't appreciate movies that are not predictable. As a matter of fact, I can do without movies that are incredibly predictable. But in any event, the makeup on these two characters' faces are uh, noticeable. In in other words, it, it is really good, and it blends in with the characters really well. For For a second, I compared both of their faces to the species of Ferengi, which is the extraterrestrial race from the Star Trek universe, probably most notable in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, particularly of a character that is a Ferengi by the name of Quark, who's played in the show by Armin Shimmerman, and has has since appeared in other Star Trek incantations after the next generation and Deep Space Nine. That's probably the best way I can describe their faces, but they're not as distorted or as obviously disfigured as, say, the face of Rocky Dennis in the movie Mask. And I'm I'm using caution when I describe their faces, one, because I'm on the radio, but also to avoid sounding insensitive. But either way, you watch this film and you know there's something different about their faces. And also, as this movie leads on, these two characters might not quite be human. And that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm not going to tell you what kind of creatures they are because that will definitely spoil the narrative of this film. But it's it's a movie that not only has a gripping love story, yeah, and I, I do actually mean that, a gripping love story, but it also calls into question the main character and who she thinks she actually is, who who she assumes she is, and the awakening that she gets when she discovers this other seeming soulmate, and also where what actually might describe or explain her 
unusual, some might say, deformed face. I wouldn't say that, but some people would. So Border is a very interesting film. It's based on a short story which is called Grands by John Ajivide Lindqvist, who is, of course, a Finnish writer. And, of course, I can't, I didn't get a chance to read the story, but the movie was quite compelling. And it is interesting that it's based on a on a short story and it's an, and it's one hour 50 minutes long and the movie takes some great twists and turns it has fantastic panoramic cinematography particularly of the nature scenes in this film i really liked it and another thing to note is that border is in has been doing pretty well in film festivals such as the Cannes film festival but it's also Finland's official entry into the Academy Awards for Best Foreign Language Film. It's going to be months before we figure out what movies will be nominated for Best Foreign Language Film, but if I see this as one of the five nominees, I will not be surprised at all. In addition to great makeup, it has a a fantastic story and great acting, particularly by Eva Melander and Eero Milanoff. It gets my rating of a knockout. It is one of the most unique movies I've seen this year and really one of the most fascinating. And I caution people that it is entirely in Finnish, so you're going to see subtitles at the bottom of the screen. But don't let the subtitles fool you. You will be taken in by this great story. (laughs) Juice, Mom. Juice, juice, juice. Mommy, why are we going to the store? Mom, Mom, I want juice. Mom, Mom. Your child will have different needs at different stages of life, and that includes the car seat. See, car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. Go to safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is a documentary, which is called Say Her Name, The Life and Death of Sandra Bland, which I saw actually in theaters a couple of days ago, but it is actually going to be premiering on HBO very soon, or maybe it already has. Either way, it is an HBO documentary. And who is Sandra Bland? Well, Sandra Bland is an African-American woman. Actually, she's deceased because of some mysterious circumstances surrounding her unfair arrest in a routine traffic stop and also her, her stay in jail, which ended up in her dying. I wish I could have put that more elegantly, but it is actually quite mysterious how she died because when... Police found her in her jail cell. She was hanging from a noose that she created using a clear plastic trash bag that was in a trash can in the cell in which she was staying. So the movie investigates both why she was stopped, why she was arrested, and also the circumstantial evidence surrounding her death, which may or may not have been as it seemed. For instance, she, she actually took a questionnaire when she was brought into custody. And she, when it, when it said, when it asked, are you suicidal? She checked the box. No, 
But there was also some evidence against her because apparently she tried to get pregnant and had a miscarriage and felt like killing herself a year ago before that. She also described to friends in her one phone call that she had pain in one of her arms, yet the noose that was tied together using one of those trash bags seemed to be tied together intricately for someone who had pain on her arm. There's also no video evidence to support the idea that she committed suicide. So even though the case is a little bit open, it still has not been solved whether or not Sandra Bland actually killed herself in prison. It's unlikely given the evidence that's presented in this documentary or if a cop actually might have killed her in the prison. It, it, there's a lot of evidence that I don't want to give away. And the directors, Kate Davis and David Heilbronner, use a lot of great archive footage and interviews with just about everyone involved with Sandra Bland's life and death. In life, she had her family, who included her mother and her sisters. And in death, sadly, she had several of the officers who arrested her in Texas on what appeared to be a routine traffic stop. And, of course, the, the police footage of her getting stopped and everything the policeman said to her and everything to which she replied is all here in the documentary. And I think the, the documentary filmmakers would have been lost without that footage. But in addition to that, there is also some co compelling footage of Sandra Bland actually getting arrested because somebody who was nearby actually took out their camera or rather their cell phone and videotaped what was going on, which is a, which is an occurrence that happens a lot from these, these traffic stops and probably have brought have brought awareness to the rest of the country more so than in the years before smartphones, which is probably one of the biggest benefits of smartphones of <laughs> this, for better or for worse, of this century. So there is a lot to say about the life and death of Sandra Bland. I have about three minutes to discuss this movie with you, but it's it's appalling to watch a film like this. And I, I don't watch these films and get a sense of enjoyment from them. Obviously, it's a very serious topic about police brutality against African Americans. And Sandra Bland did not get the same kind of media attention that other wrongfully killed African Americans did at the hands of police, like Michael Brown, like Trayvon Martin, who wasn't killed at the hands of the police, but by a neighborhood watchman. But I'm not going to get into that. But in any event, Say Her Name does raise an interesting question that actually one of the nominees for Best Documentary Feature Short Subject from this past Oscar season did. Why are police being as brutal to people they pull over, African Americans, who are clearly no threat to them? And what is it about the way they handle the situation that it, they find it necessary to re resort to extremes when arresting these people. For instance, in the case of Sandra Bland, there is an altercation or a verbal altercation that occurs between this white officer and her, but I don't know when I'm watching this if it was entirely... And you know what? For, forget that I don't know. It was not necessary for that officer to handle Sandra Bland the way he did. Not only taking her out of her car, but also actually having her face down on the ground and putting a knee, putting his knee behind her back as he is cuffing her. This is something you do to somebody who's brandishing a machine gun or a machete or is actually serve, actually doing harm to other people around him or her or potentially him or herself. But you don't do this to, to somebody who is just driving around and they may not have driven perfectly. They might not have 
signaled correctly, but how it escalated to that, I I just don't see that as I, I don't see any part of that being necessary, and I don't think that anyone who is watching this film will either. But it is indeed a, t- uh, a touchy subject, and it's one that has gained considerable attention not only from the media and from viral videos, but also from movies that have come out recently, such as The Hate You Give, which has just made its way out of theaters, which was an excellent fictional depiction of an incident that could have and probably has happened in real life several times. Welcome back to The Dog Show. Up next, we have Satchmo. Satchmo is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right, a group known especially for their couch snuggling, ball chasing, face licking, and of course, companionship. Now, let's see him in action. Look how he makes eye contact with his person. That's actually known as the treat stare. How intuitive, and now he appears to be excitedly turning in circles. Ah, the happy dance will come in with this group. But really, the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Satchmo is to meet one. Visit the shelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I just realized that the break kind of caught me by surprise because I was so busy talking about the incidents surrounding Sandra Bland and her arrest and her death that I forgot to give you my rating of the movie. Well, it is undoubtedly a knockout. I would not be surprised to see this movie be nominated for Best Documentary Feature. It does an amazing job with its interviews, with its archives, footage with its new footage so i highly recommend say her name again it's not a film that is a comfortable enjoyable movie but i think it's one of those movies that is necessary for people to see particularly well members of all races and maybe even all ages should see this film because there is a serious problem in this country with race relations with the police, and also police brutality. So, and it's not getting any better. And I think it's movies like these that remind us that we as a society could do better. So with that said, now that I've reviewed all the movies that I have to review for this show, it's now time for my next segment, which is What's Coming Up Next. This is a spoken word preview of movies that are coming out this coming weekend, although this weekend being Thanksgiving weekend means that many of these new movies are coming out Wednesday, November 21st. And the big one that's coming out this Wednesday is Ralph Breaks the Internet. So this movie takes place six years after the events of Wreck-It Ralph, and it has Ralph and Vanellope, who are voiced by John C. Riley and Sarah Silverman, respectively, discover a Wi-Fi router in their arcade, leading them into a new adventure. And there are several um, notable voice talents in this movie, not only John C. Riley and Sarah Silverman, but also Gal Gadot, the woman who played Wonder Woman, and Taraji P. Henson also have uh, voices in the for this Coming back are Tessa Thompson, who played Michael B. Jordan's love interest, and Felicia Rashad, who plays Michael B. Jordan's mother, as well as Apollo Creed, Carl Weathers' widow. So I'm definitely seeing Creed 2 this weekend, and I will let you know what I think come next week's show. Another movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is Robin Hood, which is another remake of The Immortal Tale, this time with Taron Egerton as Robin Hood. And he is a war-hardened crusader, and his Moorish commander... Uh, who's played by Jamie Foxx, mount an audacious revolt against the corrupt English crown in a thrilling action adventure packed with gritty battlefield exploits, mind-blowing fight choreography, and a timeless romance. This is a movie I'm frankly not excited to see. I mean, I've I've seen so many incantations of Robin Hood that, I don't know, it just kind of lost its 
touch for me, but I'm going to give this movie a chance. I do like Jamie Foxx. Taron Egerton was really good in the Kingsman movie, so this movie might have a chance to be good. Again, I'm not making any judgments, but I will see this movie this coming weekend. I'll let you know what I think come next weekend. And with that said, that just about does it for this week's edition of Words on Film. And Words on Film, another reminder, is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. Another reminder that the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film, about movies or otherwise, are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast, or the station as a whole. And... In addition, before I sign off, I just want to wish every single one of you out there a very happy Thanksgiving. I'll save happy holidays until a little bit later in December, but I really got, I hope you guys have a great Thanksgiving Thursday. And until next week, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.